Hi, uh, my name is Mark Ward and I'm the festival programmer for the Red Line Book Festival and we're here today with the last event of Between the Red Lines, which is a little mini festival that we dreamed up to brighten up your lockdown. Um, before we go any further, we will be back in October with uh, Red Line Book Festival 2021, which is our 10th anniversary. And the dates for that are the 10th, uh, sorry, the 11th to 17th of October. Today, I'm delighted to be here with Lisa Harding, uh, who this is a proof of her new book. It's not the actual cover, the beautiful cover is on the back. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, proof of her, her new book is out in March. So I'm just going to introduce her. And we're going to have a little chat about the new book, Bright Burning Things. Lisa Harding is the author of one previous prize winning novel, novel, Harvesting, which is currently being adapted for screen with the director of Dairy Girls, funded by the BFI. Her second novel, Bright Burning Things, is due for publication on the 4th of March and has just been optioned for film. Lisa, welcome back to Redline. How have you been? How has this weird time been treating you? Oh, it's so lovely to see you, Mark. Um, I wish we were in person. I know. You know what? Honestly, it was fine in the beginning. I, I was really creative and I, I kind of, um, I used the time really productively. But I have to say since January, I don't know, I've kind of lost it a little bit, not, not sleeping and the anxiety has crept in. I think it's yeah. the longer it goes on. Um, I, I think we all we creative. all know how it's going. You know, it's like we all know how it's going, yeah. and it just seems a bit endless now. So it does. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. But you know, okay, I've got a dog, oh. as you know, which is wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. He's keeping keeping you, keep you very good. active. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were the first Redline Book Festival writer in residence in 2019. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? What was your favorite thing in the whole experience and how did you find it and how did it help you? And tell me everything. I think it's interesting because my favorite part was the actual interaction with the group, like, the, mm, you mm. know, the weekly meetings and um, the kind of improvisatory approach and all of us working together as a group. It was such a brilliant group, as you know, and um, people were really into it. And it was very creative and I felt like I was in a rehearsal room. And I think as someone who used to be an actress and now is a full time writer, I really miss that. Mm. So I loved that process. And then, you know, I, I'm used to kind of either writing the words or being up there, but they wrote the words and I directed and they were amazing. Their performance was amazing. Um, we did a night performance and I was so proud. It was my first experience of kind of being, you know, director. Um, yeah. And it was and a wonderful just, show that you put together. I have it was a to great say. show. It was, yeah, they were it was kind group. of it was kind of the hit of the festival. People were talking about it for, for months to come. So yeah. you should be very, very proud. Um yeah. today we're here to talk about your new novel, Bright Burning Things, as I held up earlier, which is out on the fourth march from Bloom Tree. Can you give us an overview of the book? Well, it's about Sonia, who is a mother actress, an actress who's not acting, so she's kind of a blocked creative. She is alcoholic and very highly charged. And it's about her journey kind of through recovery, although it's not a classic tale of wrapping it all up, but it's mm. her journey kind of, you know, to learning to manage her own impulses. She has to face up to trauma from the past. So I'm not great at the old one sentence. No, thing. You're doing it. it's, it's hard to do because it's such a big thing, but no, yeah, you're doing it's kind of a psychological study really in a, in a Absolutely. woman, you know, a very intense period in her life where her mental health is really challenged and it's funny I was talking to a friend about it today and I was like <laughs> I've never been closer to Sonia's you know state of mind than I am at the moment and I think a lot of people are really yeah. struggling with the nature of isolation being grounded you know turning to alcohol perhaps more it's, than it's we such, should or normally. It's such an unusual time there was an article on uh, the Times recently and it was like I don't like my wife anymore lockdown has made me realize that I don't yeah. like them and things like that are happening and yeah. oh, what people are taking for granted is shifting Very tough. and our identity has kind of been brought into question and I I think Sonia my character we meet her at a point in her life where that's happened because her identity as an actress is eroded yeah I know that yeah. <laughs> and she has no outlet and you know she's on her own with her little boy and her drinking has escalated and it's at the point where it's quite dangerous when we meet her. Right and can you give us a little peek into the world and maybe read a little bit from it? Yeah I'll read I'll read a tiny little bit this is kind of her this is her in a nutshell. Okay. Okay 
speed helps. I've always known this in whatever form it comes, running used to do it, sprinting, then amphetamines, anything that sped me up, helped me outrun the voices. The kick of performing did it, let me step outside of myself, my only awareness, the pulsing of blood in my throat, wrists, veins popping and dancing, swimming, fucking oblivion. Roberto taught me the feeling of speed behind a wheel, usually some kind of Ferrari, Granted, this old jalopy couldn't exactly break speed barriers, but it helps. The car shaking, loose parts rattling, the engine roaring. It creates an illusion of winning, of outsmarting the shadows, outrunning the curses. Anything that lifts me out of myself, even for a sweet blessed moment, even the blaring of the horn in the opposite lane, the car swerving to avoid me. My breath is caught high in my chest and I feel turned on like when Roberto would take me in a public toilet. I catch a glimpse of my son in the rear view mirror, jumping up and down in his seat, rocking against the belt, testing its limits. Wow, I mean, def definitely a kind of distillation of our whole <laughs> voice there and the kind of the urgency and fervor that kind of takes us through the whole book. Um, she's such a unique character. And I, I think like you mentioned voice as well. I think for me reading it more so than a lot of first person, obviously first person narratives are, are in the character's voice, but this is all about her voice. This is all about her and her internal workings and her mind. Where did she come from? And how was the journey from the initial spark of that voice? to kind of the book we have now. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I mean, voices, I guess that, cause I was an actress, right? So mm, I started mm. my training with acting and I did do quite a lot of improvisation training. So um, I tend to, when I write, I tend to write monologues and this is a long monologue really. I mean, there are scenes, there are a lot of dramatic scenes as well. I use quite a lot of dialogue, um, but that's just natural to me. And I think it is my training voice um, I'm not very good on the old, you know, third person past tense, beautiful narrative, like that <laughs> kind of, it doesn't come naturally to me. So oh. the use of the monologue, the first person, the, the present tense, that immediacy of being in the moment, that's really, that is what I instinctively do. Oh. And um, she, she came, <laughs> genuinely, I was thinking about my own trajectory and stopping acting. Right. Mm. And what that did to me and how I wasn't prepared. I, I, I did choose to stop acting, but my career was not anywhere where I wanted it to be. And I was frustrated, really frustrated. And yeah. I felt really thwarted, to be honest. And um, so I started to write and I felt this energy. And it's a bit like um, an addictive charge, you know, acting mm. for me and for a lot of people is similar to getting off your head. Like it's brilliant, but it's very hard to recreate that ever again you know being yeah, on stage. Yeah. the kick of stage um performance and people clapping and just the terror the adrenaline so and i you know and i started to think about the nature of addiction i have people close to me who suffer with very serious addiction to alcohol um, mm. and i thought about my own kind of you know addictive impulses and really it was a lot of that was <laughs> whether it was attention seeking or needing to just get you know, but I was a terrified actress. I mean, I was yeah. living on my nerves. So yeah. I thought about that when I started with Sonia because she's an actress who can't act. It's kind of dangerous. And funny, now we have, obviously during COVID, there's a lot of performers that, you know, their identity has been brought into question a year of not doing what you're meant to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you have stuff like the, 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 I'm sure you saw the infamous thing a few months ago in the UK where it's like, you know, the, the picture of the ballerina it's like well she can retrain to be an engineer just kind of be totally devaluing the arts absolutely you know? and it's who you are you know absolutely so for Sonia that's re she needs to get back on stage she needs to you know I think I'm okay because I have <laughs> I have my writing and it's it's a similar you don't get yeah no it's it's, it's interesting because obviously I knew you were an actress and I, I was gonna I was gonna ask kind of where why you shared the history but I think you know uh, that kind of rush of acting very much comes across and there's a lot of performance in her voice there's a lot of yeah you know and how she speaks there's a lot of artifice and construction 
yeah. and putting the best putting a certain face forward um and I think like you said that comes from her being an actress that is not acting and her being stuck in very much the situation that she's in about those omissions kind of I found it fascinating she has those um omissions in her voice she has these white hot rages which are never verbalized and moments where she loses control and they're not explained because they don't fit in her narrative was that something that you knew you're going to do or did it just come out of her voice or, or wh- where did that come from? yeah that wasn't conscious at all I think mm. um I wonder is that about you know the nature of blackout well just you know we've all well maybe we haven't or something but I certainly want to <laughs> I certainly know what a blackout is. And I know, like, when I was younger, I wouldn't qualify that, but I do know that feeling of kind of, well, being told the next day, you know, you were a crazy woman, you were like dancing, and I was like, I don't remember. And she, you know, Sonia's pretty, her alcohol intake is pretty dangerous. I mean, it's white wine, but it's, mm. it's way over the top, and she's not eating properly, and she has a kind of blood sugar problem. So she's really... The alcohol has kind of, you know, pickled her at this point. And how much of what she's experiencing is real? How much is fantasy? How much is that blurred reality that you get when you're drinking? And then the experience of going into rehab where you have to put it down, like it's a proper detox. You know, I remember I was very surprised when I visited this person who's close to me. Like it is proper detox. It's a proper Mm. shakes, you know, the, the mind tricks you. And that nature of, yeah, lapses in memory. Um, and I think you said the word rage. She has a lot of rage that she has not expressed. And when she no. puts the alcohol down, she has these whiteouts, yeah. And I, lo- I love I, I love that, you know, she's saying one thing and thinking something absolutely yeah. violent and vulgar at the exact same time, which sometimes slips out, but never, never articulated. It's always that omission. Um, I was just thinking about the white wine almost. I was reading, um, I got a proof of Sophie White's corpsing and she talks about drinking, you know, becoming, not becoming, an, but having an addiction mm. and drinking white wine and it being something that, you know, well, it's great because it hides the stains. It doesn't stain like red wine. It's not stain like this. There's something yeah. very, you know, it's, it's, she's very much, uh, Sonia in particular, it's very much a, a suburban yeah. character and it was interesting because I read this I read Bright Burning Things about two weeks after I read Shuggy Bane mm. which I don't know if you've read which yeah. also um, has you know uh, yeah, uh, I read it way after my book was even oh of course but, no, I mean there's no oh, there's no similarities yeah, really I was just thinking the the only similarities or difference I was thinking was um you know a very kind of poor working class um background alcoholic mother and in your case you know very much suburban Dublin kind of the differences between them that was just what interested me I know so. and and in Sh- Agnes Spain you know it's lager isn't it it's that's her yeah. kind of she's God and anything and then it becomes it's so severe I mean the white wine addiction it's it's very prevalent I think and you know where does it tip into a problem it's it's yeah. a problem when it affects your personality and it puts those at risk around you at risk she's got a four-year-old well he's five he's turning five yeah. you know she's not she's a sweetheart Sonia I mean a lot of people don't like her at all I think she's kind of a sweetheart and I think she's quite funny but she you know she's not a particularly good mother she's no <laughs> she's quite dangerous yeah but she's also quite magical you know she's got like all that mania and all that fun and all that glamour and Agnes had in, in Shuggy Bane had all that mm, amazing mm. glamour and she was such an amazing character but I think people you know alcoholics I hate that label but perhaps yeah. you know there is a kind of a um, it's kind of hyper saturated the world isn't it everything yeah. is, you know um and there can be a lot of humor um of there can absolutely and like I think I think like you said that that kind of mania in Sonia's case definitely helps her parent in a lot of ways it helps her kind of you know in in some ways it gives her the energy to deal with the small child and 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 um Hubie Herbie I keep calling him Hubie because he calls him Hubie but definitely um yeah I think and family relationships obviously in the book are quite strange yet throughout the whole center the whole harsh book 
is Sonia's love for Tommy. Um, and throughout the book, Sonia comments and all, it, there's a lot of it obviously about motherhood and single motherhood in particular. How do you think motherhood and notions of single motherhood play out in this book and how do you think it's affected by the story? Well, I I didn't know, like I when I sat down to write this, I didn't even know Sonia was a mother. I'm not a mother, right? So yeah. that was kind of an, int- it was interesting, but I thought, wow, what if, you know? And um, there's, a, there's a section in rehab where the nun, Sister Anne, kind of puts it up to her and says, do you think your alcohol, alcoholism, your addiction to alcohol is linked to becoming a mother? Because mm. in Sonia's case, she's got a lot of trauma attached to motherhood. She didn't, her own mother, and it's kind of, I have obfuscated it, like it's, it's obscure in the book, but her mother had mental health issues, definitely. Mm. And she died when Sonia was young and she can't get a grasp on any memories, you know? So I think when motherhood can be very triggering for some women. It, you know, if their own parenting was very unstable, they haven't looked at things. Um, and poor Sonia, she's completely on her own. She doesn't remember her mother. She doesn't remember being nurtured. She doesn't remember being held. She doesn't, mm-hmm. very strained relationship with her father. So I think it's a triggering of trauma. And that's, um, you know, she really has to face it. And she does yeah. in the book. I, th- I think that the obfuscation you're talking about is really interesting because I found, you know, obviously the male characters or father and other characters feel like they can decide what's best for her in a lot of ways. They they yeah. they kind of talk without her presence about her, um, and I thought that was was really interesting. It's it, it feeds into the fact of her obfuscation, and you know, on one hand she's this unreliable narrator, but on the other hand, you know, they've removed her from her own life. In certain mm. ways yeah um i think uh, how was the balancing act then of of kind of that obfuscation of of working with a somewhat or unreliable narrator um you know i think my favorite unreliable narrator is Bumba Thumbers and Nabokov Lalita yeah, how did you f- find that balance of you know letting the reader know enough but also not giving them enough certainly I don't know sense. if I got the balance right though Mark I like, think I, you did I think you did You see, it's very hard to know because I was so close inside her head and Mm. like she kind of, um, it's a bit like, you know, acting method, (laughs) method acting or method writing for me. So she Mm. was writing, you know, I was kind of like, I felt a little bit mad writing her, to be honest, not a little Mm. bit quite mad, but mad is, is not even fair. It's like somebody who's so unfiltered and so out of control of her own impulses and god love her what i felt the most writing her was that she's constantly in conflict with herself yeah so that's really difficult for any addict is you know that absolute like how do i trust myself if i am on this path that's destruction Mm. how how do i trust myself around men how do i trust myself around for her you know around looking after myself looking after my little boy so i think she's pretty articulate and she's pretty intelligent, you know, so she Mm. can analyze and interpret herself. Um, But that drives her quite mad because she's constantly seeing herself from the outside. And as you say, the performer in her is also kind of witnessing herself. So she's Mm. she's very self-aware and at the same time can't seem to get a handle on some of those more destructive impulses. Um, I think I think that compulsion is is, and you know that is something you write very well. Like I found when I read your first book, Harvesting, I found it, it very compulsive as a read. Like if I couldn't put it down because it was quite, the pacing was so much had me by the throat that I had to keep reading. It's almost a cliche if I couldn't put it down, but I really couldn't, you know. And I I find that very much with uh, Sonia's voice. It kind of carries you through the whole book in this kind of white hot fever so it's mm. I, yeah quite the fan um speaking of harvesting um that was obviously your first novel and it's a devastating look at sex trafficking it's currently being adapted for the screen can you tell us at what stage this is at yeah we're um so it, it's been lovely recently it was a tough beginning because the expectation was that I would write it myself and to be honest you know adapting your own book and I'm not a screenwriter it was very very difficult but Mm. now I'm working 
in collaboration with um, Michael Lennox, who's the director of Derry Girls. And he's also, he's a very gifted screenwriter. Now he hasn't done much screenwriting, but the two of us together, it's a really good combination. I'm loving it. We're handing in a draft to the British film industry, I believe in March. So that's coming close to fruition. And I've loved the final stage of this, but it's tough, like it's tough making material and trying to put it into a whole new, you know, genre that I'm not trained in. I read lots and lots of screenplays and it's been a really steep, amazing learning curve. Um, Don't know if I necessarily recommend. I mean, it's like everyone's individual, but, you know, I was thinking bright burning things has just been optioned and I don't think we'll see, but I wouldn't want to be number one writer again. No, that was my my net. My next question was bright burning things has been optioned. No, 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 it's fine. But um, and it's been optioned before publication, which is wonderful news and a great, you know, great uh, launching of the book in a way. Um, can you tell us anything about that beyond it being optioned? Is it all hush I'm hush? Not allowed. It's, it's, no, not I'm allowed. Not allowed because there's there's, just, there's discussions with directors at the moment, and it's you just wonderful. I just can't say. But it has a hunt like we've we've signed contracts and it's been officially optioned so that's all that's, that's all like that's a, two films in progress this is very exciting this yeah this is very exciting um so to close just before we close if you would read us your favorite scene that to you sums up tommy and sonia's relationship just to bring it back to the book okay so yes this should be pretty self-explanatory my boy raises his face to the sky and licks the drops as they fall Will there be a storm, Yaya? He loves storms like me, loves the thrill of thunder, his tiny body rocking to the bass notes, his eyes fixing on the flashes of lightning. I think of the early summer storm of three months ago when the two of us flew out the front door to the green and danced barefoot, body swaying, chasing the flashes, willing the lightning to come find us. Last one to the car is a pooper, I say, running in my bare feet, flip-flops in hand. Pooper scooper, he sings, laughing. In the car, we play the game of colours. Any colour we see, we have to describe in terms of something else. Tommy started this one himself accidentally when I asked him to name all the colours he could see inside and outside the car. He started by saying the colour of snot and grasshoppers, yuck, the colour of the sea on a sunshiny day, the colour of the sky on a cloudy day, the colour of Herbie's hair, the colour of rain, the colour of Yaya's hair, the colour of Yaya's happy. What he's actually seeing as he says this, I can't imagine. What is it, Tommy? What do you see? Is it that seagull? The color of ice cream, he says. Oh. Funny little fella. <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's, such a, he's such a cutie. And I could see him so clearly, him and Herbie, i.e. Hubie, um, Herbie. Yeah. throughout the whole book. Um, yeah, and I, I've just got a dog recently myself. So that whole little, little relationship between Tommy and the dog. I yeah, Herbie's like it. another boy to Sonia. He's oh, absolutely. Son. Yeah, he's he's amazing. I love Herbie. He's absolutely. one of my favorite characters I've ever written. <laughs> no, he's wonderful, and he's, he's you know he's such a vibrant portrait of a dog. Like he's a yeah. member of the family, as as they should be. Um, my last question then is possibly the question that all writers should dread. What's next? Well, apart from obviously the films, which is a huge amount of work, what are you working on now, if anything, or what? Are, what are you planning? Well, no, I did. And, and like in the beginning um, of the pandemic, I wrote a draft of a new novel, entirely new one. It's different, It's but it has, it's kind of a coming of age set in, you know, a, a, a college campus. I won't say which one, but you, you know, mm-hmm. my middle class. Um, and it, it's kind of a revenge drama. So there's a, it's got a real thriller edge. I didn't think that happened, but I think I was, channeling some kind of anxiety but um I need to go back it needs a lot of work it's it's very messy but I think it has a good there's a crazy voice at the center again um a 19 year old this time oh fantastic well that sounds like a a great start to what I'm sure will be a brilliant novel and we can't wait to read it and hopefully we'll have you back to to talk about it when it comes out Lisa thank you so much for being here today it's been a pleasure to to see you again and to chat to you um, Bright Burning Things is out digitally on the 4th of March and in print on the 18th of March, both from the Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. No problem. Bye. Bye. Bye.